Number one, people really, really, really like selfies in India. Every meeting I had, I took at least one selfie afterwards. Um, and, well, like, just aside, uh, people are extremely friendly. Um, like, I, I, I don't think I had ever such a welcome anywhere, uh, including at home, uh, including, like, literally my own flat. Um, imagine you had, like, an indie band, uh, like, a few years ago. Um, it had like one or two hits and then you go to some other country and you figure out that all of a sudden your indie band is like really, really popular there. This is how, how I felt about like the companies I worked at, like uh, Product Hunt, um, uh, AngelList, OnDeck, like all of these companies are ex like were fairly popular in India for multiple reasons, but like one of the main reasons is that they give opportunity, uh, global opportunity to global talent. And uh, this is something I really recognize there. And this is also like one of the things where I kind of like shape my career around. And uh, this was like just an awesome. So uh, tons of selfies. And I want to like give a shout out to everybody who organized the meetup for me. There were like countless people who did this. And like also like a lot of people who came and I, I really, really appreciate this. Number two, and this will get, can get me canceled on... Um, Indian Twitter. Indian food is not that spicy. I don't know where this myth comes from. I don't know why people keep saying that. Um, yeah, yeah, I know, I know, I know. This is controversial. Like, this literally could get me cancelled. Um, so, let me explain, okay? Indian food has heat, okay? So, it is quote-unquote spicy, you know? But, like, no Indian cook would ever like destroy flavor to add more spice to it. And when you go in comparison to like a Vietnamese or like a Thai place, they just like throw 50 chilies in and you're done. Uh, I trust me, I had like, I, I challenged multiple friends of mine to bring me to the spiciest places. Like it's all good. It, like it's, it's way more like it's good food and it has heat, but it's not that spicy. I make my own hot sauces. So I'm a little bit biased maybe, you know, but I, I think that's like an overdone that like the work little software update on this one at least. Um, number three, it's beautiful and I highly recommend you reading up on the actual history of India and um, I tried to read some of the, um, the Vedas, some of the um, like parts of the Gita, parts of the, and so on and so on. Um, and I also like, um, I'm a big history buff and like I highly recommend you to um, read um, about the East India Company and like the actual history of the quote unquote conquest of India. Um, big spoilers, it wasn't a country, it was a private organization. It was um, mostly Indian soldiers and mostly Indian money. Uh, it's like one of those weird parallel universes that we live in, where one of the biggest, most like richest empires actually fell to like England. Um, highly recommend you to read up on it. Like I still learned that um, a lot of like misconceptions around this. So. Um, there's a really good podcast by the, uh, uh, called Empire that looks like a very good series on this. And there's a really good YouTube series by Extra Credits. Highly recommend watching those. Um, yeah, I, I'm still like one of those generations that grew up with the whole idea that like the British Empire was undefeatable and like technology advanced, all this kind of BS. Anyway, beautiful country, highly recommend. So the main thing, um, there are three things that I would like to get covered today. Um, a little bit of like the speed of growth um, and, and, and progress in India. Uh, number two, um, how India is using uh, software, uh, essentially productization, to solve societal problems with a scale of 1.4 billion people. And also like to talk a little bit about deep tech and like, um, uh, yeah, the aspect around deep tech in India, which is extremely interesting due to the quality of research there. Uh, especially number two, I wanna go into it, okay? Um, so, as always, the rules, uh, please join the chat, share your POV, ask questions, we are here to hang out, okay, like this is meant to be low-key, chill, I'm having, want to have a good time, I hope you two guys too. Um, there won't be any pitches, there will be uh, people um, like showing their products and talking about their challenges, but the goal is not that people um, like pitch you, you know, or me, the goal is not to have... Um, yet another shark tank or something I like. You know what I mean? Like there's enough shark tanks, we don't need another one. Um, and so on and so on. What happened to my camera? One second. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so this isn't like funding pitches. This isn't shark tank. Like, you know, like we are here to help. Uh, I hope you can help. Like I hope you can like add your own POV and your own thing ideas. 
and all this kind of stuff, and so on and so on. So, agenda. We've got the DPI. Um, we go into DPI, and then we have like three founders joining for office of hours. I'm already like a little bit delayed, so uh, Tanush, one second, I'm very sorry. <laughs> um, so, Indian 2024. Um, the number rule in tech is if you are working in tech, your CEO or CFO is Indian, okay? Quick shout out to Naval, my ex-boss, or your CTO, uh, CEO becomes Indian, like Mark here, okay? And this is like a meme that's becoming more and more true, and it shows a little bit like the quality of Indian tech talent and like the impact it has on the world. Um, but more importantly, India has like an absurd, ridiculous growth story right now. This generation will see India becoming a world power. And if you talk to people there, they know it. And they all want to be a part of that. Like it's really, really interesting how you have like a, an extreme excitement and also like an energy where people actually want to be part of that um, like global story and also want to be like an... Um, like have their, like literally they own their part of it, like start their companies and all this kind of stuff. Uh, there's a certain pride to this, which I thought like extremely interesting because when I grew up in, like made in India was like meant to be like low quality as a, like a, um, yeah, essentially like an, an, an argument for low quality. The modern POV on this is, um, the modern POV of this is like, couldn't be further away. And now this is like India with pride, which I thought like, Oh, like it's really cool. Um, also, um, it's no longer doctors, it's no longer lawyers. Like the, the modern job uh, that your auntie wants is that you become a founder. Indian matchmaking sites have uh, founders, like startup founder, as like a keyword that you can pay for, and it's one of the highest paid keywords. Okay, Start, being a startup founder is cool. Being on Shark Tank is cool. You know, like all of a sudden your family is actually pushing you to become a founder. Um, the growth of amount of startups is ridiculous. Um, and also the fi fi uh, filters are insane. Like to put this into context, uh, parents are recommended to also have their children to apply to US colleges as a backup because the filter to get into IIT, which is the Indian um, Institute of Technology and like it's multiple universities is so high, uh, multiple times higher than um, IIT, um, MIT, for example, as you can see here. And all of this on a ridiculous scale. Um, I remember when I arrived in Ahmedabad, I was like, my main impression was like, this is a relaxed, small city and finally a little bit more peaceful compared to Mumbai, which has like 20 million people. Uh, Ahmedabad has more inhabitants in one city than by the whole country I am from. Like it's like eight point something million, million people. Okay. Like, we're talking a ridiculous scale here and it's only growing. Obviously we're talking high scale, but not necessarily like high volume, like, like, the purchasing power is still small, as you can imagine. Um, even to the point that like only a small percentage of Indians actually pay the taxes. Um, so uh, the interesting part, like there's multiple aspects here, and I don't want to like make this into like an economic lecture, and I want to get into the DPI part, which for me was the most interesting one here. But like one thing that's really interesting to me is how you the best way to think of India currently is that you have basically three groups of India, um, quality of living, uh, basically Mexico, Indonesia, and Sub-Saharan Africa, and all of them can be in the same city. They can literally be neighbors. And the scale of this is like, insane like if you if you're not indian like one uh, like 1.4 billion people in total like if the progress works india will have like two americas at the quality of life of the usa within india and that won't even like that would be a fraction of the whole population still so if you have 1.4 billion people the interesting part to me at least is um how do you actually solve those problems and one thing that i've personally thought is extremely impressive is uh, that they essentially use productization as a solution to this, which as somebody from Europe where people struggle to have even standards is crazy, okay? Um, let me explain what I mean with this. Uh, it's called dig digital public infrastructure, okay? And um, on a high level, I will explain it in a minute, but the main problem I have here, and it's like we're talking ridiculous scales, I will get to this in a minute. I'm not an expert for this and I also want to learn, okay? And lucky, I have an expert for this, okay? Uh, the person I want to get on stage, quote unquote, now is uh, uh, Tanuj. 
Um, and let me quickly get him on. Okay, Danich, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Cool. Danush, I will quickly switch uh, to Zoom so that everybody else sees you too. And okay, guys, give me one second. So. Okay. And we are switching to Zoom. Hey, Danush. Hey. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, you're live. Uh, we have currently, um, I think, I honestly don't know to like how many people because Twitter doesn't give me the correct numbers, but like I assume like roughly 100 people online. Um, wow. if, if it would be cool for you, um, what I would love to do is if you could give me like a very quick summary about your background and I will quickly, uh, just to support this, I will just like screen share uh, and show the slide where I have you, okay? Um, okay. To make this a bit easier. Okay, cool. So. Okay. Um, I am Tanuj, I'm an engineer um, by training, and then I started a drone company sometime in 2013, 14, uh, and sort of used to build and fly drones when that, you know, I was doing it in India, but then the government banned drones, they just said no more drones. So I decided that it's it's a, a harder problem to work with the government than literal rocket science. Um, so I tried to figure out how to do that. I found my way in building digital public infrastructure, that's the I spirit, the big of five years in my in the middle. I was a VC also somewhere in the middle uh, trying to do this. iSpirit is, was a strange organization, just like my strange organization, where it was mostly volunteer-led. So I joined basically for free, was doing all this stuff, building UPI and other things we'll talk about. Um, and essentially, I've been doing that for the last eight, nine years. It's just that I've been doing that in different roles. Um, you know, I, most recently, I started my own organization to do that called People Plus AI. Um, so... I want to quickly quick give people a uh, rundown what um, uh, DPI actually means and obviously what's happening with my thingy. Can I not? Ah, here. Okay, sorry. Um, so what was really interesting to me is, um, so DPI stands for Digital Public Infrastructure as far as I understand. And I will just like ramble for five minutes and then you explain me everything I got wrong. Okay, I will just tell you what I learned on my trip and you tell me what I got wrong and what I got right. Okay, okay. so think of it as like government tech, quote unquote, or government standards for technology. And the main idea here, which, which I thought is extremely impressive, is that it's like all essentially thinking in layers. So uh, the, the, the fundamental layer is identity. So being able to say who is who, and that and, and, and version of that is like um, uh, KYC, know your customer, but also like any form of like, just like knowing who the person is that is um, using a service. And like, this is fully biometric. Um, the second one here is payments. And like a lot of people here know that like India uses QR codes to pay, but like I wanna get into the scale for this in a second. Then there's aggregations. I can have all of my documents, all of my bank accounts on my phone as a, person from a country that accepts facts as like a way to send documents to the government this is like insane to me okay but more importantly i want to get also like into ODN, uh, o -N -O -N -D -C, um which is basically a standard how to decentralize the concept around transaction and marketplaces which i would love to get into because this kind of shows where everything is going so this like how how, how correct was i like how much butcher how much did i butcher this um, so I, I'll say first, public, not government. Okay. That's an important distinction we'll get into. You're talking mm -hmm. about public infrastructure, which is different from government infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, second, layers is, is good, but it implies inner layer, outer layer, upper layer, lower layer. Right? It implies some positionality. We prefer protocols when they are truly protocols, mm -hmm. because protocols is essentially implies, look, we're just sort of, you know, um, we're just agreeing to communicate or transact in a certain way. Mm -hmm. That's the basic fundamental thing, um, because when you say layer by layer, right, uh, often we made this mistake where we talked about how these things got built, ID, payments, data, right, and we mm -hmm. also talked about India's stack. Um, later, when we tried to internationalize this and we took it to other countries, we realized the whole layer by layer methodology doesn't stand, right, because mm -hmm. people then think they do the same journey. We must first have a digital ID, then we must have payment, then we must have these data exchange, data aggregation things. Uh, but there is no um, sequentiality implied in the core idea, mm -hmm. right? It's the idea that 
you know, we have an infrastructure, a digital infrastructure to assert one thing that I am who I claim to be. Mm -hmm. So with my digital ID, my Aadhaar, um, I can show up anywhere, enter a 12 digit number and then either biometrically authenticate, fingerprint, face, iris, or a one-time password on my cell phone, which is linked uh, to my account. Mm -hmm. And I can prove that I am indeed Tanuj Bhojwani and I'm not mm -hmm. some imposter from Tanuj Bhojwani. And I do this digitally, cheaply, etc. This unlocked a lot of transactions, uh, you know, because trust is at the root of transacting with people, mm -hmm. right? Whether I'm government giving welfare or etc. Similarly, with payments, what you talked about, the QR code, essentially the QR code is just a standard to, you know, in a way that you agree and I agree and our comp my competitor agrees and everybody agrees. And this is how you encode the payment address. Where, when I say I want to send you money, where do I actually send it? Is encoded into that QR code. And we just agreed on that standard. To actually send money, there's a switch. There's a bunch of things mm -hmm. happening, which we get into, right? So those are the two sort of things I had to say about this. One, public, not government. And second, it's not really layers, but sort of various protocols intersecting and, you know, like uh, working with each other. That, that's how I would put it. The, there, like, there were like two things um, really interesting to me here. Like number one is the scale. Um, yeah. So this is like a slide I found on, uh, on UPI, like the payment. Um, yeah. It's on the scale of uh, Visa. It's not like the same size. I think it's like a fourth or something right now. Yes. But it's also like not yet full population penetration. It's still like comparably quote unquote early, you know what I mean? Um, but it's at least in the same magnitude. Like a fourth is like ridiculous in size if you think about it, right? Um, it, um, India makes 57% of all real time payments in the globe. 56%. So time, yeah, 56, 57% of all real time payments. So okay. every time somebody Venmo's each other and the equivalent of that in any country, uh, one in every two transactions in the world is in India. So to, to put this into context, okay, when I go outside here for lunch, I have a coffee shop next door where I, after like weeks of flirting with the, I think, 60, 70 year old owner, okay, female owner, um, convinced her that I can always pay with card because I will always add like tip so that she has the cost of the card included. Because in Berlin, people don't like credit cards yeah. as payment. And we're not talking QR codes or phone payments or anything like that, you know? Um, so, so, so like, I, I, I'm like in a developing country right now in comparison, okay? <laughs> yes, that's true. Um, look, to be generous to Germany uh, is that uh, it's easier when you don't have technology to leapfrog to the newest and latest and the greatest. So India had that advantage. We didn't have too much card presentation. Uh, I, I always hear this. Like I, um, so like from, like, okay, cool. Like ID, you know, like I know fintech founders in Europe that would kill for proper European wide. Um, and that's like a third or fifth of the population, you know, proper European wide EKYC and a proper account aggregation, you know, we have like open banking and stuff, but like, and that's just a fraction of this. When you say leapfrog, let's jump into ONDC because that's like where it's like heading from my point of view. Can yeah. you quickly explain what OD ONDC is? Because I completely butchered the explanation before. <laughs> Perfect, no worries. So the, the idea is that uh, on the left of this diagram, I, I don't know if people can, can I just sort of annotate? Yeah, okay. Uh, can, okay you can I just point? Yeah, I think so, that's uh, right. Can I... Can I just uh, point to something? I just want to point to something. Is this color? No, I'll have to certain color. Okay. I'm going to butcher your diagram further. Let's just look at this side of this. Do of you, this equation. Do, one second. Um, yes, perfect. We see it. Amazing. Technology works. <laughs> exactly. And that too on a video call. Right? That's the, <laughs> the technology goes to die. Okay. So on that left, on that side of the diagram, think of that as Uber, Amazon, or any other marketplace that you're very familiar with, right? Um, it, so there's a buyer, the buyer and the seller is being intermediated by a middleman, right? And in the original promise, if you remember, if you're old enough uh, to remember, when these guys came in, they said, oh, we'll, we'll save you money, buyer and seller, we'll help you facilitate transaction by cutting out all middlemen. Except they became the biggest middlemen, mm -hmm. so big that they can now squeeze both sides of the market. We see this with Uber, right? Like Uber currently has a lot of scandals and Lyft too that like they overcharge drivers and basically take the most of the commission, like most of the money, essentially. Yeah. You don't know if there is any transparency in the tip is actually being given to the driver mm -hmm. fully. Um, uh, you don't know if the ride fare quoted to the to the rider is the same fare quoted to the driver for the same ride. In India, people like drivers, if you get into an Uber, I hope this didn't happen to you, but 
they'll ask you how much did you pay how much is uber telling you mm-hmm. right because they don't ask uber at all mm-hmm. so that's because in you know these people sort of are built on the promise that we'll cut out all the middlemen but trust us we'll we'll run it fairly we'll do everything fairly mm-hmm. um, this is there is network effects which i'm sure everybody is familiar with so i won't harp on it but the network effects is essentially the idea that 1 plus 1 instead of being 2 is maybe equal to 3 because you know everybody is in the same network that extra differential that alpha from 2 to 3 that one is captured by uber mm-hmm. right and that is why they are willing to subsidize both riders and drivers initially to build up market share corner the market and then get to a place where they can then start squeezing everybody yeah yeah uber eats i saw last week tonight john oliver just put this out there about uber eats and grubhub and the, you know the food delivery guys where the food delivery guys are uh, you know uh, making ordering in very cheap not paying riders who deliver a lot Uh, but still making losses, and their investors continue to give them money because once you capture the market, it's it's large enough, it's lucrative enough that you I mean you have pricing power. Mm-hmm. So that's the model really here, you know, aggregation. Mm-hmm. That's that's consistent thing. In a zero interest rate world, you could keep doing that. But if you really want to have an open, you know, like a bazaar, mm-hmm. so a very word for market, a Persian Arabian word for markets, which is where sort of the, everybody has their own sort of way of doing things. Like an Uber ride is very standardized. right but if you want to have a bazaar what you want to do is that instead of one such platform or two such platforms the oligopoly of such platforms what if we had a multiplicity of such platforms right so you have um, uh, many many sort of platforms who aggregate uh, drivers and many other platforms who aggregate riders and some platforms who aggregate drivers and riders but can these platforms talk to each other such that if i go to let's say uh, you know what's a good bike hailing app or like a bird scooter mm-hmm, kind of mm-hmm. app can i go there but book a cab which is listed on uber mm-hmm. right can i go to that app and book that instead mm-hmm. I want to have that kind of an experience you need the ability for these two buyer side platforms and seller side platforms to talk to each other yes right um this also helps because what you can do is you can create a market that's specialized right so think about visa again we'll go back to the payment example mm-hmm. to simple and think of how payments an open protocol works in the visa example visa goes to banks and says banks get me people who will get cards right whom you can issue cards to so holders of cards and visa goes around acquiring merchants right again via banks so some bank acquires a merchant and some other bank acquires the customer mm-hmm. and visa takes both these makes banks. a match making mm-hmm. right so visa is the network mm-hmm. or the protocol here connecting buyer banks which could be people who issue card issuing banks as they are called and seller banks which are the merchant banks right the, the people who go get the merchants and visa collects a fee from the whole transaction and distributes it to the buyer banks and to the seller banks right mm-hmm. um but there's only one like visa and mastercard then between themselves have an arrangement that our machine should be able to talk to each other which they may or may not include american express into but imagine if there was one standard for all card machines so, so... that all card Oh, yeah. like just to, to to wrap this up like this is some summary so like so basically the way i can think of ondc is like an a standard how uh first i can discover uh yes. items services whatever and also i can agree with you that i am now transacting it so basically i show yes. you my upi payment um you confirmed and now on this protocol we have now paid and like i you owe me now this service essentially um right. The, the the thing that was like my, uh, really really interesting to me here is um so for example with UPI like there isn't like one big app by the government there isn't like every bank has their own app there is like multiple people building UPI apps and the same is true with like ONDC right so for example like in your example with Uber uh, or like with Amazon there could be multiple people building specialized clients for the consumer or clients for the uh, provider okay. um specialized okay. use cases i could have like um, i think you told me like i saw this in bangalore like they have an uh, a pro- like a proof of concept essentially which is like a tok tok uh, uber which is completely yes. built on ondc can you explain me about this for a second yeah uh, uh, namma yatri which, which means my ride in in the local language here where basically um you know all that your like an uber is doing is matching a, a driver to a rider right and today they take a share of the commission they are in the payment flow etc this app says hey look i am going to uh, it goes to the auto drivers the tuk tuk drivers and says hey 
why don't I create an Uber side app for you? Like, like the driver side app for you, where you just come here and any ride that comes in, you'll get a notification. You can choose to accept or reject it. And for this, I will only charge you a commission. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I will only charge you a daily fee, like a fixed fee. So 25 rupees a day, which is less than half a dollar a day, right? 30 cents a day to be on the app and unlimited number of rides you can get, right? This is the model. That's all they do. They just get you rides, show you a location, tell you where to go. But who's giving the rides? So on one end, Namayatri has its own app. They have a consumer side app as well. But mm -hmm. they are now integrating with every other consumer app in the country. Mm -hmm. So in my payment app, I can now book a ride. Mm -hmm. Because Namayatri is an open network and it says, look, we're trying to be a driver side network. Mm -hmm. Right? We're trying to be a driver side app, uh, demand side, uh, sorry, supply side app. So if we get the tuk-tuk riders on the app, please somebody else go get the demand. We don't want to be in the CAC by LTV business. Yes. We don't want to be in the daily thing. We are a, and uh, the origin of the Namayatri app, by the way, guess who made it? It's a company called Just Pay. Mm -hmm. They actually made the first UPI app in the country. So once you realize that, look, we are infrastructure builders. What we are mm -hmm. very good at is making very, very low-cost transaction infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Now a transaction is a transaction whether you're transacting money or you're passing messages about rides. It's the same thing. Yeah. So there's an under open protocol called Beckin, B-E-C-K-N. Mm -hmm. And they've just basically implemented Beckin for a particular category called tuk-tuks, right? The, 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 part that's like, the, the part that's crazy to me is like, so um, in this case, for example, like anybody can build like the provider and uh, consumer apps or like use cases, you know? But this also means if you think it through, like this could mean um, I purchase a product on that uh, uh, network essentially or marketplace or whatever you want to think about it um, and then the logistics would also come for like a different use case of ONDC which is like the endpoint logistics which could be like the delivery company um, where the delivery company might not even know the shop I'm buying from they might not even know um, the, like they, they might know nothing they're just like hey here's yeah. a package for you to send you know and Correct. they might not so it's not like um, it's easy for us to imagine this like like Amazon and UPS and this kind of stuff. But like instead of saying like, hey, let's give one big company like the majority of um, the economy in that industry in your country, you know, which like I think you have like a strong history against, you know, um, yeah. in that case, it's much more like, no, let's establish infrastructure um, anybody can use and build innovation on top of like whatever they need built on top of. And I think that's like the, the, the most interesting thing here. One question I have here is, um, where, like, so like this is already a little bit hard to contextualize for like me for percent. Like this is closer to like something like, I don't know, Google Shopping or something on Amazon. Like, or like this is closer to like the, the pitch decks I receive for crypto pitches where I know it will never happen, you know? But this is real. This is like already implemented, like people using this, you know? So I think your current state is like, room. yeah. Few million transactions a month right now. I think last count three million transactions a month. It's yeah. Still very early. Days. This is like this is like better phase for you, right? This is like an early yeah, alpha. Very small number <laughs> <Yeah>. for India. <laughs> um, what is like if you think this further? Like, what is the next iterations of this? Like, this is my this is my last question. Then I'll leave you be. Like, from from your point of view, like, what's the next things that will come? Like, if you think of this as layers, okay? So we have like identity, then we have payments, then we have like uh, discoverability, then we have transaction. You know. Like, what do you think is the next things? Like, what are you currently working on, for example? So, um, working on two things right now because AI is all the way so AI related. Mm -hmm. One of them is a open compute cloud. Um, okay. So we're basically saying that all compute capacity at the end of the day is compute capacity. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, sort of what AWS builds, the services it does, it tries to lock you in, right? And mm -hmm. the biggest bit you can get is from observability. Mm -hmm. Um. If you want a SaaS and you want to deploy it easily on AWS or whatever, as a marketplace, you're paying 15% of commissions, right? Mm -hmm. um, storage is a similar thing. We are paying egress costs. Mm -hmm. So we're saying that one of the problems happen is that once the, you have these very large, big leaders in these markets, they set business models for everybody else, right? Mm -hmm. Why is there not a business model? Like I was telling you in the, in the Namayatri versus Uber example, Uber used to take a commission, 25%, 30%, whatever. Uh, Namayadri just said, no, hey, I have a different business model. I am a software provider. I'm going to charge you for that software. It's a SaaS model for ride hailing as opposed mm -hmm. to a commission model for ride hailing. Mm -hmm. Right? To do that, I have to be light. I, I don't have a consumer side thing. I'm not doing any marketing. I'm not doing any, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, CAC, right? Like there. 
And but so therefore, because I forego that, I have a good business model and I'm cheap to drivers, so drivers can opt in. Mm -hmm. This same idea applied to compute. Why just mm -hmm. AWS or GP, right? Anybody who has some data center and you know, or can build a data center and bring something online. This is serve it. This is literally the promise of like multiple pitch decks I've seen in the web three space. <laughs> Um, this is crazy. Uh, so basically, the, may, the way how I can think of this is like now it's like a protocols for service. And in this case, like more and more real time is important. So I like I don't want to five, wait five minutes for the server to arrive like a tuk tuk. This is like instant, right? And then the, the next logical thing here is, uh, if I understand you correctly, uh, is also like around um, like having clarity who this, who this service is, who is the company behind this and all this kind of stuff, right? So the other thing that we now see that in India for the last 15 years, we've been unbundling. We've been doing a building block, one thing and do it well. So identity, one building block, mm -hmm. payment, one block. For companies, we have this tax network that had a company ID and then uh, transactions and verified transactions and then data sharing protocol. All that was there. Mm -hmm. Now I think what we're trying to do is rebundle them into services that make sense. Right? Mm -hmm. So one thing we're trying to do in the AI world is essentially today, um, you know, all our communication channels are very user hostile. Mm -hmm. A company with resources can call you, spam you, call you multiple times, robo call you, AI call you, etc. But you mm -hmm. have very defenses. Caller ID is broken. So we are trying to have trust and privacy first communication protocols. So we are saying that if somebody calls you or somebody's trying to call or reach you or text mm -hmm. you or anything, why can't we have a meta protocol that on that that says, hey, this person is who they claim to be, mm -hmm. right? If they're asking you for money instead of simply paying them, you can pay an escrow. That escrow will release things only in three days from now. Mm -hmm. Right. So that you can be sure if there's a fraud or whatever, you can dispute and get that money back. Mm -hmm. Right. Now we're trying to rebundle this into an AI first architecture, right? Where well, this is trust is, is broken. So we're trying to sort of replace WhatsApp and phone calls and text with this overarching new sort of communication layer to transport messages between that P2E P2P and P2M. Um, which we're trying to like, it's, mm -hmm. it's still coming for the Janki Bath. I'm doing a launch event next month and the protocol will be launched next month. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's basically we're trying to sort of go after what WhatsApp does and do it with a lot more trust, knowing who's calling you, reaching you, having a lot more control and consent over who gets to reach you. Today, if your phone number leaks, right, Andres, if I just go to mm -hmm. a website and put your phone number today, you're going to get harassed. Right. And so very bad system. You're making this sound like a challenge for people in the chat, by the way. Like you're making it sound like <laughs> 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 teasing. <laughs> yeah, but I wouldn't post it. But like think about it. the phone number is such a vulnerable ID. Yeah. Every time I give it, I cede control over who can then, you know, reach mm -hmm. me or harass me. I have zero control. You can say call block or whatever, but it blocks your phone. You can't receive other calls where you're getting a blocked call. Right? That that communication infrastructure is really not built for the upcoming noisy AI age will be living in. Mm -hmm. That's the next protocol we're going after. This is amazing. Um, so as somebody who lives in a, uh, in a country, um, in a union, where if I want to invest, I have to understand the legal entities of like 35, like I don't know how many European Union, like 30 plus countries, you know. Um, I have to understand all these nuances, okay. Uh, I can easily see in like five to 10 years, a future where on top of these kind of standards, there will be like an investment protocol to invest into startups, into public infrastructure, sorry, into, into uh, pension funds, into all kinds of things, you know. Um, there might be even like, uh, it's more likely that like an AI that I ver verified know who this is uh, on resources I booked over this network will invest into a company, you know. Uh, this is more likely to happen then currently uh, uh, that in the European Union, we will approach this kind of problems like this. And this is like what was the most, most mind blowing to me because it's not just about the standardization, it's also about the productization. To think of a problem as an opportunity for product, you know, to just like, just give enough surface area of standardization plus APIs that people can use to solve the problems for the market directly. And this was like the one thing that really impressed me. That was like really, uh, uh, yeah, mind blowing to me actually. Yeah, so we we always call it public, that's why you call it public mm -hmm. infrastructure, private innovation. So it doesn't matter that a private, say a philanthropic entity funded the public infrastructure. Mm -hmm. The infrastructure should be public for anybody to come build a solution on top. That's and therefore we acknowledge that the context and the solving that a private player does, nobody else can, mm -hmm. right? Which is 
it's not government doing this and government solving problems right because then you go back to socialism control authoritarianism this is about laying the road so that people can start building malls start building gardens start building a bowling yes. lane start building everything else right yes building enough infrastructure that other people can solve it yeah makes yeah, a lot of sense build a community around it build it in their way build different mm -hmm. business models right? cool look in the long run i just want to finish at this point mm -hmm. today if you go out to germany there's you, you might have a high end shop who'll give you no questions asked returns will mm -hmm. like give you best is will say you know what the customers always right and there must be like dollar stores or thrift stores where like you know hey this is what it is buy it if you break it mm -hmm. if you don't like it then too bad mm -hmm. right we don't have that in the internet anymore on mm -hmm. the internet everything in this uber or uber eats or like grubhub or whatever it's like all good for us for consumers mm -hmm. but real screwing up the economy and screwing up the supply chain and centralizing and like following yes. the middle you know, what costco did or walmart did and all of that so the same thing is happening on the internet we are trying to recreate variety diversity mm -hmm. we're trying to call it unified protocols yes. right not uniform protocols because they're combining everybody into one thing and letting them talk to each other reduce friction yes. but not pose their opinion on how the market should be yes it's basically right. if you think of the internet like as in the iso layers it's basically yeah. saying why stop at this number like why stop at seven or eight like just go like a few yeah. layers higher you know um makes complete sense uh tanush thanks so much for joining and like uh giving us a crash course on this uh to me personally this is absolutely mind-blowing like if i could invest in this into as a startup like i would invest i also love that you are literally pitching what you're currently working on you know, so you, you're basically like one of the founders who will join in a minute, you know, which I personally really love. So thanks so much for your time and like keep us in the loop. Yes. And and if anybody's coming to India, feel free to reach out. I'm Panuj at peopleplus.ai. Thanks so See much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okie dokie. Um, so I know this is like not my typical kind of content, you know, uh, because it's, you know, it's, I'm trying to get like uh, experts here, you know, but to me, this is like one of the most impressive experiences, not just like digital payments. Um, you have this in multiple countries. It's like actually thinking systematically about these problems as from a software POV, which I thought is a completely different approach to this kind of stuff. I know similar concepts like from Estonia and I'm a big fan of those, but on the scale in India, I haven't seen so far. And this is like something I wanted to share. So. Um, let's get quickly back to the traditional programming. So we're doing office hours and, um, I don't, uh, I want to try something today. Okay. I do not claim to be like an expert for India. Um, and we have like only Indian founders today. And I also do not, uh, claim to be an expert for deep tech. And we have at least one company where I had like absolutely no idea what I should recommend them. So I wanted to get like an, a friend of mine to join. Uh, and the friend is Raul. Um, let me quickly check if Zoom works. So, Raul, uh, whenever you've got a moment, just join the Zoom link. Yes, perfect. Nope, that's not perfect. Um, and this is why it's a live show. Cool. Um, Raul will join in a second. Uh, Raul is like an early stage investor in uh, India. Uh, he worked at Antler and a few other things. Uh, invested first check into a lot of companies that I highly respect. And this is why I wanted to get him on, uh, especially an expert for uh, airspace. And um, yes, here we are. Perfect. Yay. OK, it's working. It's a live show. This is a live show. This is meant to be a little bit buggy. Airspace and um, yes, cool. Um, yeah. Cool. Mute the stream for a second because otherwise we have a little bit of a problem here. Cool. Raul, you here? Work. One second. My computer is freaking out. Perfect. Um, I will get the. F uh, what we do today is uh, I wanted to Raul to join. Um, and this is an experiment. Like you guys afterwards, let me know how this works. Okay. Um, whenever I am like, kind of like, I have no freaking idea what to say. And you will notice by me just rambling. Okay. I would love you to join in. Okay. Uh, before we do this, like, can you quickly introduce yourself? Because I, I think I butchered your explanation a bit. Super. I, no, no, I, I think you did a far better job than I will, but thanks for having me here. Andres. It's always fun to jam. 
for folks on the stream i invest in deep technology businesses in india i've been in the indian startup ecosystem for the last decade i spent the first half of it building companies in fintech and educational technology and then i decided to go tap into the inner child in me and try and build a space company but i did the next best thing and started investing in space companies so i've invested in about seven companies so far the first of these is a hyperspectral imaging company called pixel i this was the first investment i ever made and i've been investing in the space of space now for almost uh, six odd years before it was a cool idea to invest in space been very fortunate to do that i invest in all sorts of deep tech from space to energy materials to battery systems um computational systems uh, new kinds of semiconductors chips across the spectrum and there's a lot of interesting stuff that's happening here so i think i'm just uh, what we discussed i'll do a quick 2 minute overview of mm -hmm. some of the interesting things that are happening in india for our global audience to give you guys a sense of what is all possible here uh what are things that can happen as well and mm -hmm. uh if people are looking to build in india it's a good time to actually come to india and build this is an open invitation to everybody who's on this and people who are in the country definitely a great opportunity for people to build so i'll quickly i i can share my screen right mm -hmm. you can yeah then just one second and then afterwards we get uh, our first founder on and then afterwards we get like our first founder on yes we'll just do that sorry to have uh... okay so sure super so uh... can you folks see my screen mm mhm so i i think there's a lot uh, that people know about india a lot of people just heard about the upi boom in india about the digital public goods that are being built out um i focus a lot more on the hardware side of things that are being built out in india and the story i want everybody to know globally and even for founders in india who are thinking of building out is how this ecosystem is shaping up today so all of these companies that you see the ones from india might recognize the ones who are not from india please google some of these names these are some of the most phenomenal companies that have come out of india uh from graph ql systems to rocket launching systems to um battery management and battery power systems so what i want to very quickly give you guys a sense of is indian founders have truly started defying the norm the last 20 years of india's uh, startup story was all focused on e-commerce uh, we started early 2000 with just four companies and as of today we have 23 e-commerce unicorns that have come up in the last two decades and there is a cyclical reason why these things happen and we believe the same thing is now going to start happening with hard and deep technology companies in india because all of these companies that i told you about earlier are spawning of smaller and smaller companies so the indian space ecosystem has gone from four companies back in 2017 to almost 200 new companies that have happened in the last 7 years that are uh, registered as startups and are building out different solutions so i just want to give you guys a quick overview of all the opportunity sets that exist in india um and why they exist in india a large part of it is the rate in entrepreneurial activity that shot up year on year the number of scientists and research pools we have the third largest pool of phds that are graduating every year we've had close to 400 million dollars that were just raised specifically for pure deep technology companies in india in 23 it's growing roughly at a 40% cagr uh, foreign vcs like andreas are investing in india as well and coming to do this so it's a great place to come and build because of the ecosystem and the largest is the ecosystem that's been built out here in india with primitives that are available in close to 12 billion dollars of capital expenditure that's going to happen in the next decade and a half just to spur all of these things and i think that's phenomenal that we're going to see so i want to tell you guys about how space has evolved there are a lot of things to cover in this um, but i think instead of making a space lecture i want to cover very quickly about how we can how there's a broader trend of people building for the world from india not just software services that you were about to see but also about every kind of hardware that you can see so i want to quickly show you some of the hardware things that we built out in india and what's going to happen so um 
the first thing, this is all, sorry about this. These were some other things that we wanted to cover, but we're running short on time. So India opportunity, um, want to cover specifically space. All of the products that you're seeing are all indigenously built in India at the moment from turbo pumps, turbo props, satellites, rocket launch systems, 3D printed rockets end to end. All of this is being built out in India. Um, aerospace and unmanned systems, you will see some founders today. We've gotten everything from high altitude pseudo satellites to agri platforms being built out where India has always been a use case first country. Before building technology, we find a reason to build that technology and build it out. And we've gone a little, I would say, cuckoo over aerospace and unmanned systems and how excited we are about that in India. Um, dual use technologies, uh, the defense ecosystem has pushed over the last three years to back close to 300 plus startups with grants that have been given out to build different kinds of real, um, import substitution products out of India. India, I, I don't know for folks who know this, India is the largest importer of defense equipment in the world globally. We in, import 10% of all global defense equipment sale. Um, all of this is being indigenized and is being built out within the country as such, leaving room for amazing companies to be built out. Robotics, you've heard enough about it globally. We've crossed the trough of disappointment and we've actually come down to real use cases that are being built out in India. And there are very unique situations that allow for something like this. Quick commerce, for example, is an area that has managed to survive and thrive only in India. And that's creating newer kinds of warehouses which require newer kinds of primitives and robotics to be built out. Uh, applied materials is a huge area with things where India is investing billions of dollars. We just set up the first fab facility based out of Gujarat. There are two more planned and the entire ancillary ecosystem is being built around this. Uh, another fun fact for people who don't know this, uh, the largest number of chip designers in the world are Indians. Energy systems, another fun fact for you guys. You heard a lot of fun facts from Tanuj. 60% of the energy capacity that India is going to have by 2050 is yet to be built out. And it's all going to be built out using renewable energy systems, using cutting edge technology. We don't have the baggage of replacing existing systems. There was somebody asking in the chat about how India is able to build these systems at scale so fast uh, about passports in Germany and how it's a hit and miss and sometimes it's small. It's because we have um, no legacy code to work with. We don't have the headache of an existing system that we've got to keep. I, I always can... believe this is like a weird excuse. Uh, like it's it's absurdly hard to design this kind of stuff, you know, no matter if you have legacy or not. Um, sorry, like I always like I always hear the leapfrog thing, you know, I always hear the leapfrog thing and I'm like, yeah, great. Then let's also like leapfrog now into the thing we need in like 10 years. You know what I mean? Like if that's that the only thing to do. But yeah, sorry. <laughs> No, absolutely. Uh, I, I think that was the end of it. Like the mm -hmm. deep tech slide was the last thing I wanted to show. Uh, just in the last two years, the amount of capital going into it has grown by 4x in mm -hmm. many ways. I think that's phenomenal. So these, this was just a sampling of companies, but I think uh, it'll be more relevant to have founders come up here and yes, talk let's about do action, this. Let's do uh, this. Building um, sweet. And sorry, just one point to what you said, yes. Andreas since we're jamming on this yeah i don't think it's legacy code that's a problem but mm -hmm. legacy code comes with legacy institutions and legacy incentives yes and i think for that is the real problem code is easy people are hard yes and especially like also like in europe we have like a, i mean i want to do like a whole session on this like in europe we have a huge issue with fragmentation and incentives to keep it fragmented you know and there is like, like we have estonia like estonia knows how to build all of this you know yeah but we're still like completely fragmented Anyway, before this gets political and whatever, you know, um, and by the way, I want to do like one show at one point about space tech, especially Indian space tech, because I think that's one of the least discussed, extremely popping industries in India um, that I really want to like highlight at some point. But uh, today, uh, the first one, uh, we have like three. The first one is uh, focusing primarily on Gen AI and uh, built like an absurdly ridiculous product for the stage he's in. Uh, it's Kartik and I want to get him on board. And uh, let's see, Let, let's do this, Kartik. Yeah, let's do this. So, hey Kartik. Do you hear me? That's a yes, I assume, right? Hey, Karthik, can you hear us? Uh, 
Wink yeah. if you are in danger. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, wink if you are in danger. Hi, folks. Hi, folks. I uh, was just listening to the convo. Great insights, Rahul. Cool. Hi, guys. Thank you so much. You guys are the ones building it out, man. I'm just giving yeah. comment. So, Karthik, um, your company. Um, yeah. What I would love to do is if we, uh, or differently put, like what would be useful for you for today? Let's start this way. I uh, would love to show you folks a demo of what I am building here at Creator. Mm -hmm. And I have some questions here as well on, you know, so you are in the US, I want to crack the US GT and you have cracked it. And I have some other questions regarding the, uh, our ML strategy as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I would love to go through the call in that manner. Perfect. Let's do this. Yeah. Uh, so hi folks, uh, Karthik this side, I'm a engineer turned designer. I have been working for the last uh, four years, uh, started in sales, got into marketing. Then I'm a designer uh, for the last three, four years, started creator eight months ago. So when I was a designer, I always thought that the way we used to design, it's it's not the right way. So, you know, uh, whenever you get a PRD from your product manager, you have to draw some wireframes, then build some designs on top of it. And then it goes back to your product manager once again. Then that product manager and some senior product managers have some discussions on it. Then you get back, you know, you know, get back at it again. Then you rewrite these things and a month passed by. Mm -hmm. You have only tested one idea, nothing has been built. So I, I always thought that this is not how the way design should be done. I have been trying to solve this problem through different hacks, but uh, eight months ago, I started a company called Creator. So with Creator, you can test out your ideas quickly. What used to take months right now, take minutes. Can you, uh, show, us, can you show us a bit? Yeah, sure. So just sharing my screen. I hope it's visible. Yes. Perfect. Yeah. A, sure. be a beautiful uh, desktop. Yeah. So uh, this is how creators dashboard look like. So we'll just quickly get started with any idea that you folks want to build with. And I, I think Andreas, we had a call earlier as well. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. So, so like, yeah. That's it. What's the idea? Like we should tell you any kind of project? Yeah. Anything. 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 And this is this yeah. thing will design it. Okay, cool. How long have you been working on this? Like eight months? So what did you say? So, so, uh, we, I started, initiated the idea eight months ago, but real coding we have been doing for the last five months only. Holy. Okay. 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 Cool. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. any idea like, okay, let's, let's do this with the chat, yeah. um, chat. If you have a good idea, throw it in right now. Um, yeah. we will, uh, like Raul, like what's your suggestion? Like if we make a, like, if we make like a little bit of like a pitch for the pitch condition, like Raul, what's your idea for like a product that he should design? Anything, any, any. Okay, this is, uh, okay, off the top of my head, and since I've been thinking a lot about it, um, an accountability system app, something to keep you okay. accountable. Okay, well, uh, what does this mean? Like, um, you, you make a promise, and then afterwards the app checks in if you did it, or what? So, uh, you align towards a project that you want to do, and it comes up with pings, motivates you, ensures that you end up getting to that end outcome. It could be a fitness goal. Think of it maybe, I, I don't want to call it a health tracker because I think mm -hmm. it's too common. I want to use something that's a lot more active in prompting you to do it. I, I have a, a yeah. yeah, like, I, I think that's cool. We have a few other ones in the chat. So we have um, GitHub for non-coders. I don't really know what that means and I don't want to see it. This sounds scary. I think, I, I think that GitHub for designers, so probably not. Okay, okay. The second <laughs> one is uh, an email app by a guy who's actually building an email app, which might be like, imagine now you design it like in five minutes and he gets like a heart attack, you know? Um, and number th three is like a reading app, okay? Um, okay. Let's do the email app. I want to see the heart attack. Okay. Let's do the email app. Okay, so sure. let's make a modern email app. Like uh, I want team functionality and I want it to be um, fully like minimal UI and like very much like almost like a chat interface, you know? And I want I want able that the team can also join and like- uh, Can we, can we, can we just slow down a bit? I have to write it as well. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, and, 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 and a modern email application, okay? Mm -hmm. A modern email application uh, where the whole team has access. Uh, and this, this is like built as a mobile app. So basically I have a mobile app where it's somewhere between a CRM and like an email app, I guess. Okay. And I, I like, I really want to see this and we have like right now a founder in the chat who's building this. Uh, if, if this thing can build it quicker than him, then he might have a problem. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's let double down on this. So a modern mm -hmm. email mobile application where mm -hmm. the whole team has access to the mails. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Um, the idea is to, um, 
like it's basically a team inbox. So like the team can uh, have um, access to different um, uh, uh, like like for customer care and all this kind of stuff. You know, like think of Front, but like as a mobile app. If you know Front, I don't know. Front, okay, but perfect. It, but not, not the sugar team in front with all the. Okay, let's let's run this. Yeah. So uh, this is just the objective of the uh, prompt that we have just written that our model has understood. Uh, so chat, uh, do you want to edit something in it and uh, you want some specifications here? Andres, are you trying to speak something? I think oh, sorry, yeah. um, be... this sounds like this sounds actually great. Like Omer, let us know afterwards. But I think this is pretty much his whole functionality. Let's 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 roll. Can can All we right, add, uh, uh, like can can we have? Uh, I know you have integration with other tools, but the ability to categorize conversations into a CRM directly. Oh, nice, yeah. Okay. Okay, let's, let's go, folks. Yeah. So uh, the very first screen that you are going to see here, it's called the feature screen. So uh, when we were, so earlier when we built this, so as soon as you entered the prompt, you just used to show the wireframes, mm -hmm. and then the user had to do a lot of work on top of it. So it felt like a lot of work on users. And uh, in the AI world, that users don't want to do a lot of work. User wants a lot of control. So those are two very different things. Let's say you built a lot of AI tools that allows users to edit the output that still feels like work. The screen mm -hmm. that we are going to show you here is a screen where users can actually have a look at this and select the features they want to build upon. Mm -hmm. So so from, from the one line prompt that we entered, these are the features that are model has understood. And you we can select any one of these features and start building with it. One of the best things, so this is Rahul, this is the your feature that you wanted mm -hmm. to build. Uh, but the best thing about this is that you can, you know, edit the uh, user flows ahead as well. So see, designs are built from wireframes. Wireframes are built from user flows, and these are user stories. Mm -hmm. So you can yeah. delete a feature as well. So let's say you don't want to uh, this. Mm -hmm. You can delete the entire feature. And let's say you want to build on any one feature, select any one feature, and you start building on it. And the idea so, here is like basically that I step by step get more clarity on the product. Like it's basically a, a structured best practice for product design. Is this correct? Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah. So uh, 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 yeah. This is the best structured practice of product building. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, so we so, pick one of them. Let's let's pick the shared team inbox, right? I think that's a good feature to start with. Sure. Sure. So these are the user stories that we'll be going uh, building on top of it. Mm -hmm. Works. So unified inbox. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it works. I think this uh, is his full we, feature set. Yeah. Like. So uh, can, can we also have? Um, sort of an indicator to know who all have read it at the bottom. Nice. Like the same yeah. mm -hmm. You have it so that you know who all have viewed this. Like a doc send kind of feature in some ways. I'm so happy I moved out of product management. I would be, <laughs> I would be very scared. Yeah. So uh, as soon as you click click on it, so this is something that the uh, we call low fidelity wireframes. So mm -hmm. again, this is the best practice of what uh, product designers do. So one of the very uh, less modes that a product designer has in an entire company is that product designers understand which components you have to be placed where. So mm -hmm. let's say you're a product manager, let's say you're a CEO, let's say you're a business guy, you would understand how important is that feature, but a product designer will understand is that, let's say I have to show a filter. So should I use chips to show a filter? Should I use bottom sheet to show a filter or should I use pop-up to show a filter? So on this screen, uh, what we call uh, low fidelity wireframes, you will have a screen where uh, you will have a, you will have a set of screens based on your feature mm -hmm. where you can decide which component you want to see and what's the reasoning behind it. Mm -hmm. So whenever designers design, how do they generally design? Just I'll uh, open up and uh, share that with you. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. is that uh, they actually have a look at any page so let's say i'm a designer and i have a look at anything so let's say i want to build a car selling app okay mm-hmm. so i will have a i will have a look at the card the first card of it and what i'll see is that okay there will be a car image there will be car price uh how new is the car so let's say is a second hand car mm-hmm. how many kilometers it has driven you know all these things so this is called ia information architecture mm-hmm. so the if, if i have to you know just double down of a job of a ui designer or product designer it just that how to rearrange this ia in a manner is that the user interaction with it should be at an optimal way so this is the lowest down uh, job of a product designer mm-hmm. right understood so yeah this is what we are trying to do here just by providing you uh, the understanding of purpose so this is the feature that you want to build the uh, feature share team inbox so the sub features of it is are accessing the share team inbox so these are the user stories of it viewing details emails and reading status composing and sending email from the share team inbox assigning emails to members managing inbox with tags and labels and customizing mobile notifications so these are the all the sub flows that are going to be built in this feature interesting and these are all the screens around how it will look like it so let's say accessing the share team box is the first user flow and this is a first screen mm-hmm. okay so let's say you want to log in okay how will the login section look like okay why is the login section there it's there to collect and authenticate the user what are the components that are going to be there and what is the purpose of those components so this feature is hated by designers but loved by product guys because it reduces their dependency of designers mm-hmm. so what you can do you can uh, delete any component from here you can delete an entire section and as you can see these are this is how the wireframes are going to look like and you have a dumbed down version of it just for you so you don't have to be dependent on anyone and yeah so there are couple of things that uh, your users ask from us one of the thing is that right now you can only delete these sections for users are asking that hey can i get a chance to add a component yeah of here course well? yeah yeah Yes. So, so, second, so to understand second. this is basically like the first step. Like your your idea is basically you go from like one liner to paragraph to multiple features, and then like uh, break down the feature into user flows, and then break those into individual screens that you show first on like text level, like as information architecture. Like all of this is meant so that I can like step by step follow if it's like going the right path, and I don't have this weird typical experience of pressing a button and it's just not right. Is this correct? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. And and also and also on the part that uh, let's say uh, earlier what we used to do we used to directly show the wireframes. Uh-huh. So let's say you came on our platform, you entered. I want to show an email box. So what we used to do, we used to hit a Chat GPT API, mm-hmm. and we used to do something with the components and show it to users. Mm-hmm. Users would mm-hmm. come back to us and say that, hey, this is not what I want. You have uh, this is now additional work for me. I would love to spend another fifteen twenty minutes on your platform, but I would want a guaranteed good output. Mm-hmm. that okay i don't i don't have to then spend another 2 hours working with it mm-hmm. earlier what used to happen is that some people might think that okay this is a very elongated flow but users are loving it because they don't have to do anything apart from it then mm-hmm. so once the output is there it's very close right now it's 60 70% of what they want they they pick up the things they uh, they want it from here and then they do their work earlier what used to happen is that they used to then spend hours on it weeks on it and eventually the retention used to drop off mm-hmm. because we just used to give out the wireframes right now we have built this structure built this flow for the users to stay on our platform and understand the you know depth uh, depth of it yeah this makes sense like i had this experience multiple times with like um, ai builders basically like it's just not what you want and then you like reframe 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 and then at some point you just like give up you know yeah. uh, makes complete sense um and just a yep. quick question kartik so you're building this um, so all your prompts etc are you using the chat gpt api in the backend for this no 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 so there are multiple apis we have we are having an mom and we also have our own fine tuned model that is that is based on uh, llama 13 billion model so we have we, we are doing multiple things it's, it's what is not an just mom gpt api it's a mixture of models a mixture so, of models so see okay. yeah yeah so different models are great at doing different things uh chat gpt4 or, or the the gpt4 api is very good at reasoning mm-hmm. but the lava 70 billion model is very good at expanding on things very fast mm-hmm. so the gpt4 api is very very slow but the lama 70 billion one is very fast so we use some things for some tasks makes sense uh omer is like uh, right now in the like he he switched from panic to trying to compromise 
So his, yep. his question currently, is it possible to also like feed in existing status, like existing apps, existing, like can I like start off where I'm currently at already? Yeah, yeah. So this this place that you're currently saying here is add new features. Mm -hmm. This is what, what creators mode is going to be. Oh, so nice. this is the first time I'm telling, telling this anyone publicly is that you can upload any of the designs that you have. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we will do is that we'll have a look at you for those designs. Mm -hmm. We'll show you that how the user flow of that look like. Jesus. And then you can start building on it. So mm -hmm. let's say you can upload your existing designs. You tell us that, okay, I want to update this feature on this screen on my design and we'll do it for you. Mm -hmm. So I very well understood is that not every time new apps are built, uh, every time new features are going to be built, and money is where if money the money in this product is going to be in the B two B side. Mm -hmm. Where every time a product manager or product designer wants to build a new feature, they want to they have to use creator. Okay. And for for creator to be used into these companies, creator has to understand its current context. Okay. So this is the feature that we have built is that you upload any Figma file of yours. We are testing with some of them, and you just move forward with it. You can click here and extract those user flows. We'll show you the user flows. We'll ask what do you want to change. And That's then cool. we'll show you the edited video, Let's, edited, sorry, edited designs. Let's jump back to Omar's heart attack. Where are we at? 70%. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it, it's, it's right now rendering. It, it might take another uh, 30 to 40 seconds. It will be here. Mm -hmm. No worries. Yeah. 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 And so some of the other features that uh, are, are one, one of our most up, uh, you know, loud feature is this upload PRD and generate wireframes. And PRD so is what? Majorly a product require a product uh, requirement document mm -hmm. so it can be anything from a word document to a pdf to anything it's just that let's say you are a product designer so generally how a company's function is that a, a, a product manager writes up a prd shares it with the designer and the designer has to understand the user flows in the prd and build on top of it so this is one of our most requested features that designer had uh, that told us that hey can you please do this for us is that whenever a product manager gives us a prd we can upload it here and you can build us on top of it. So you can doc uh, upload any document here. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the documents that are here like that. You can any document upload any document here, and then we'll show you the designs based on that. Super cool. And yeah, the wire the, the wireframes are here. Oh, this is the wireframe. Very interesting part. Yeah, the very interesting part. We show you four iterations of what you wanted to build. There are four different types of user flows of what you wanted. Okay, to build. so just you, in case you have options. Yeah, yeah. So like, yeah. Uh, Omer can choose his kind of heart attack he's getting now. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, what's the iteration experience like? Uh, there's usually multiple rounds of feedback or change requirements. How does it handle that? Like, is it possible at any point that I go back and like change earlier versions? Is there like currently like a uh, version history? Like, can I, for example, like go off a tangent and then like go back to an original version and all this kind of stuff? Uh, yeah, so that's in our beta phase. So if you go to beta.app.test.creator, that's oh, you already built it, but it's okay. not. Okay. Yeah, yeah. We have already we are already built it. We are just testing it right now. Okay. And it will be live for our user. I think probably by the end of next week. Dude, you're making other engineers look bad. Like you're making me look bad. You know, like, <laughs> like what the hell? <laughs> okay, let's look into yeah. that. So like these are the low fidelity so, wireframes you mentioned, right? Yeah. So yeah, th this is the shared team inbox. So let me just give you an entire rundown of how these things look like. So this is the feature name. These are the different uh, user flows that are in the feature. Is that first is the composing and sending email. So this is this is very helpful for product manager as well. Is that you can you you get very readily uh, built out features and their user flows. Mm -hmm. You can have a look at it. And yeah, so these are the wireframes. So best thing about it is that you can click here, have a look at these three screens, and you can then understand okay how these three screens work like. So the the three screens here, the flow that is customized is that customizing mobile notification for shared inbox so the these three that, these three are one group that belongs to this specific uh user story user flow. user flow yeah sorry mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly exactly so user navigates the application by tapping on the menu user selects for notification setting the app displays customized button mm -hmm. so these are all the designs so yeah uh, i can share the link with you with uh, andreas but this is a shareable link of course so i can share it in the chat chat as well mm -hmm. and anyone can have a look so i'll just share it on the chat Nice. And uh, yeah. Just, okay. Have a chat. I have shared the link. So yes, like, I, will, I, will, link. I will send and, and, it. I will like let's throw it into the chat in with the audience. Like what what's yeah. the worst thing that can happen? You know, like Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh I think the so 
the best is yet to shown so this is how a screen looks like and so one of the uh, editing powers that your users are asking that hey you have shown us a screen but how can we edit it so there are mm -hmm. multiple things that we have built on top of it so this is called inter component changing as a, this is a component but what are the different types of inter component is that so let's say this is a multiple you know, by the way um, um, card, card, um not to be unpolite uh, we're like already over timing a bit um yeah, sure. i'm starting to believe you have way more features than we have time um can can <laughs> yeah, you so can you like like let's 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 jump through like uh the the next one or two steps you know and yeah. wait a minute i can replace the, the the items here holy shit okay cool yeah uh, okay yeah, yeah, so yeah. that's what i'm trying to say <laughs> <laughs> okay um let's jump into the next uh jump uh, the next uh um uh, uh, uh steps you have afterwards like assume that let's assume one of them is perfect pick them and let's move to the next one and uh the other thing i would love to ask uh, you is like what kind of questions do you have like what what kind of challenges and oh, then we can sure. like do this in parallel while the sure. thing is rendering sure sure uh, so yeah, I think uh, let let's start with this. So the final step with this, so we have multiple editing options as well. Edit, mm -hmm. you can edit these screens to user flows, and you can edit a single screen as well. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so you can generate designs. So we click on generate designs. So we have built three level of user editing. Once you look at a flow, you can edit it via flow level here as well. Mm -hmm. Is that you can edit the user flow. You can go deep into the screen. You can edit the screen just through text. Mm -hmm. That do this on this. You can communicate with the screen. And the third part is that you can replace component inter and intra. What I showed you mm -hmm. just seconds ago. Yeah, this is so, cool. Like yeah. I can basically on the low wire low, low fidelity wireframes like essentially change everything manually if like I'm not happy. So it's not like just me explaining to the system. I can literally go there and just do it on my own. Yeah, you can cool. do anything. Sweet. Uh, while this thing is rendering, um, uh -huh. uh, uh, what would be useful for you? Like what kind of Questions do you have, or like, what can the chat help? What can me and Raul help? Uh, so uh, I would love to have some power users in the chat. So as as soon as you shared the link, I think there were about 10, 20 people on the link. So would okay. love to chat with you folks at Lab. I think I can share my LinkedIn or Twitter. You can DM me there. So that's the first thing. Apart from that, uh, I I I'm I'm a I'm a bit uh, dicey on the GTM here. Mm -hmm. Is that because right now is it for designers? Is it for product managers? Because what I'm seeing right now is that product managers are a power users of it. Mm -hmm. Designers are also using it. But where should I double down is my first question. I think if any of you folks... Before I answer and before Rahul answers, like what's your gut feeling? My gut feeling is that it's for the product managers. Mm -hmm. But right now, product managers have a lot of things to do. So they don't get enough time, you know, uh, building the product. I think once the, their, their tasks are, you know, uh, automated by AI, managing the team or all those things, I think product product people will be able to do it. So there, there won't be a role called product manager. There will be a role called product builder. Mm -hmm. We'll be talking to users and all the feature building in the future will be done by AI. That's I, my gut say. I kind of agree. Um, maybe not like on all the feature building by the AI, but like even right now. Um, oh, wow. Um, so even the, even, the here, yeah. even right now, like the job of a product manager shouldn't be ceremony and it shouldn't be craft. And like, if you look at most teams, yeah. it's like mostly ceremony and craft, like to do project organizing, they do like all these kind of like, um, ceremonies, you know, they write like a lot of documents and all this kind of stuff, but like actually the job should be like really deeply understanding what the user needs and then just creating just enough stuff that other people can work off it. You know what I mean? And that could be like a power tool for that kind of job. Uh, Marul, what's, what's what's your POV? Interesting. I I think I, I love how it's it's fundamentally removing the need for what I would have as a product analyst as a manager because this is what I would sort of want to say. What I give it's fundamentally work like an AI agent for me. Just the concern I have about this is that, um, and I think this is broadly around AI as well, which generates all of these outcomes is that there's a certain learning of the craft that happens by literally writing these things down for the first time. And yeah. it's doing that that allows you to understand what to look for, how to look for, break that down. It's a, it's a bit if you think about it as you have a math problem and you struggle with it and you solve it over a period of time and the way your muscles build through that versus you jump to the last page where there's a solution available and you go through the solution one. So you solved the problem in some ways, but have you developed the muscle memory to do it? And mm -hmm. what, so not being an AI doomer on this here, 
but mm-hmm. what i'm trying to understand is then how does that skill set get built that does it mean that an entrenched product manager who's built that skill set is the one who's only going to keep using it you 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 hearing you hearing raul as an ex product manager currently like panicking yeah Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's like I, he's I, like but like this text is just like automatically there like people didn't learn their lesson when they do that you know like he's literally yeah, panicking yeah. like right now no no because i was like i, I would have taken like three days to pull all of this together and that that was like with a lot of diet coke mm-hmm. okay yeah. uh, so uh, otherwise like uh, under normal human circumstances about five days under uh non-indian work conditions two weeks So not taking awesome. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, so Kartik like um let's let's do five more minutes and then wrap up because like we're a little bit over timing already okay uh, a little yeah, bit like a lot yeah. uh, no worries uh, yeah. you're showing awesome stuff um let's quickly jump back to the current state of the rendering okay and if you have any other questions, I think yeah yeah so I have showed you the design set designs have been rendered I I just stopped the screen share can you can you I quickly show so, it yeah. again you, if I, for you you have shown yeah. it like 500 times like for you this is normal I think it's pretty awesome for us to see. Okay. Okay, no, I think the rendering. I think I've closed that tab probably. No, so it's it's here. It's here. Perfect. So 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 for the user flow that 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 we selected, this is the design that. Uh, so it's hanging a bit. So I think a lot of people are here. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so it's not getting zoomed in a bit. But yeah, so this is how the designs are built. I, I don't, I'm very sorry, zoom in rather. It's it's not getting zoomed in. But uh, yeah, this is how the designs have been built. So the user flow that we have selected. Yeah, okay, it's zoomed in now. So the user <laughs> flow that we selected, the designs have been that that have been built out of it. Mm-hmm. So probably we are we are very early in test test states of design. We are early in very states of understanding how the designs will look like. Mm-hmm. But yeah, this is how the designs look like, and you can just uh, regenerate the designs as well. You can go back to wireframes, and as soon as you go back to wireframes, you can have a look. Of, okay, that okay of of which state the designs have been built, and mm-hmm. yeah. So this is what creator is. So you can just. Select any user flow, build designs on it. We build designs on this user flow. You can view designs of it, mm-hmm. and yeah, this is this is what creator. It's pretty, is. pretty, pretty, pretty impressive. Um, so and... one, one, one just last hidden feature that yeah. we have for our special users is prototypes. Of course, you so do. So we have this live, live as well. So is that you can go on top of here, and we have live prototypes here as well. So we have just shown these arrows right now for the sake of showing it. It's a very beta feature. But uh, you can so since we have all the user flow that you can see here, so we built prototypes on based of that as well. Uh, yeah. Yeah, this is pretty insane. Um, I I will not ask because I assume there's like 80 features you didn't talk about yet, right? Like there's like at least 80 features more, you know. Um, not 80, only 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 three more. But yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Uh, this is pretty impressive. Um, thanks so much for showing this. Um, I will like kind of like wrap up now, uh, just to make sure we have enough time for everybody else. Um, sure. This is absolutely insane. Uh, my understanding currently, this is my last question on my end, is your goal right now is not to generate the actual code, but like to get to the point that there's a design and that there's like clarity of the prototype. Like people have done the U the UI demos like multiple times, all of this kind of stuff. So like people have clarity what to build. And then the what's happening with the code part? So uh, my my understanding is that ultimately in 10 years there will be no design, or probably in 15 years there will be no design left. Because right now the cost of producing code is so high, is that let's say if we get into code, then the cost of prototyping it will be so high is that whenever you want to change the code, you have to have a very highly skilled engineer. Right now, why why we are not going deep into code is that why we are still sticking to prototypes is that you have an idea, you have an existing product build, you can test out anything on top of that. You can just go and that okay, I want to t- try this new feature. I want to ten ten try ten type of different user flows. And a prototype is something that is very cheaply available right now. Is mm-hmm. that you don't need a you don't need a lot of computing power to build prototypes mm-hmm. right now. Is that it, it's very cheap for us. But let's say as soon as we get into code right now, it's a whole different ball game. Mm-hmm. So we'll, yeah, yes, we will get into code. Uh, and I think when we get into code, it will be unimaginable because the code that we will generate, because we have a lot of context of designs, wireframes, user flows, features, you know, context of why this button is there. I mm-hmm. think we'll have, we'll generate damn good code. But right now we don't want to get into code because the cost of doing that is so high. And mm-hmm. I think the, the vision is not there to generate code yet. Mm-hmm. I think that that's what my understanding of it, it right now is. 
But yeah, we'll definitely get into code. This is and, a very clear sign. And another way to think about this is like almost everybody is right now focusing on um, like right image to, code. To, uh, to code, right? Yeah. And so you might like in the end have like one commodity API you just throw it against, you know, and then like Devin or whoever is just building, for you, you are outsourcing it to Devin. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, that's cool. Awesome. Uh, Kartik, thanks so much for showing. Um, I think I agree with the chat here. Like spectacular demo, very impressive, like multiple wows, like absolutely awesome. Thanks so much for joining. And uh, yeah. uh, like folks, try out his stuff. Uh, he promised that he will accept everybody who asks for early access. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Andreas. Thank you so much, Rahul. Great chatting with you folks. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This was phenomenal, Kartik. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rahul. Bye-bye. So crazy. I'm, I'm going to walk away and decompress for some time. <laughs> Just <laughs> this is this is yeah. this is the one thing that freaks me out about India, right? Like when I talk to Indian founders in pre-seed, you know, I'm like, are you messing with me? Like he's pre-seed. I don't know if he raised, yeah. you know, like I think he might have raised one round, maybe I mean, he didn't get to ask, you know. But he's on pre-seed level, you know what I mean? Like on pre-seed yeah. level, normally when I talk to founders in the West, it's kind of like, yeah, we have a pitch deck and it's half done. Yeah. You know what I mean? I, I, have a, I have a tool to make a pitch deck now. I have a tool, yeah, That's exactly. <laughs> oh, and, and if you remember, this is what I was telling you about Indian founders, right? It's blown me away by the level of ambition that I've had the yes. opportunity to see. Like it truly makes me wonder what I was doing with my life 10 years ago. Dude. Like it's not just this product. Um, he's, if, if I'm not wrong, he just graduated, right? A year ago or he's... Something like this, yeah. Yeah. This is insane, yeah. Um, cool. Um, so this was Kartik. Uh, next one is Shri of Arctos. Uh, let's get Shri on board. And you two already know each other. So that's yeah. fun. Hey, Shri. Uh, hello, you guys can hear me? Yes. How are you doing? Yeah, let's go. Um, yeah. So for quick context, like, first of all, thanks for all the founders joining. It's like literally 11 p.m. right now, okay, in India, like in Bangalore um, and like everywhere else in India. Um, this is insane. Like for you, this is a normal working time or not? Yeah, it is. I mean, I'm a student, so I okay. keep working <laughs> all the time. Okay, yeah. cool. Shri, uh, tell us a bit about yourself and uh, also like tell us what would be useful for you, like what you want to get out of this, what you want to do in this, uh, like let's let's keep it like 15 minutes, 20 minutes, because otherwise we are like just over stretching everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Uh, I'll basically sh say a bit about myself, my mm -hmm. background mm -hmm. and uh, then what I'm building and uh, what I would ask, like the question is, uh, since that sector I'm building, which mm -hmm. is basically defense, and uh, I'm building a business for a government, basically. Mm -hmm. How do we approach it? And like, just in general, how do we, if there is any fresh ideas which I can get, any new perspectives or insights which you guys can see? Yes. And this is the main reason I wanted Raul on board, because I have no freaking idea how to sell to the Indian government. And I also don't know <laughs> any other student who is like, I mean, that's actually not true. I know multiple students, they're all based in India, who are like, hey, let's build defense tech for the government, you know? Uh, so anyway, awesome. Um, Shri, like Arctus, what is Arctus? Yes. So Arctus Aerospace is the company I'm building. At Arctus, we are building fighter jets that can fly at 35,000 feet and basically eliminate the need for uh, fighter pilots in the future. So You're building autonomous fighter jets? Yes, for autonomous fighter jets. Okay, so, so, so you like like a simple challenge. Is this where, is this like what I understand? Like you want something simple, to, you want like a simple little startup, like and the simple little startup you picked is like uh, autonomous fighter chats, right? <laughs> I mean, uh, the, it, the idea didn't come directly. It was a series of iterations. Awesome. So I had actually started out with targeting the medical industry, like basically try to build a zip line for India uh, because this was a personal problem which I had. My mom has cancer. Mm -hmm. So to get medications to that, she had like we had to book medical uh, like medicines two weeks in advance to get to a tire to city so if we missed it by a single day that would be an issue and we would miss our appointment mm -hmm. so this happened with my, my mother a lot of times and then i was like this is the sector i want to disrupt this is a personal problem for me i like drones 
let's solve it with the drones mm-hmm. and i went i do head first into that realized it's a very you know messed up market decentralized market to be honest uh, too much of disruption which the hospitals were even hesitant to even try it out like even think about it as a solution mm-hmm. so a lot of like feedback which i got was that this, how would we know how to fly a drone like drone as a concept is very alien for them it's too futuristic for mm-hmm. them despite having the technology so and uh, given the expertise and the skill set of the people involved in the industry mm-hmm. uh, it was very hard to penetrate so from there i started looking at other industries where i wanted to like i am right now a final year student at iit madras uh, and i have been working on drones basically my entire college life i was part of the aero club here mm-hmm. and post covid the aero modeling culture had died in the campus me and a couple of my friends we rebuilt that from ground up learned all of the technology contacted our seniors and like learned how drones uavs and all of these were built So, so for those people which... for those people who don't know um so IIT like as we discussed before in in Institute of Technology extremely high bar for uh, acceptance like it's really hard to get in uh extremely good research like almost in every field i've seen IIT Madras is known to be one of the best one especially when it comes to hardware and deep tech and especially aerospace and this kind of stuff so you literally like at the epicenter of india for this kind of stuff is my understanding what i also like is you were like you know what The, we need drones um and the government doesn't understand how to fly drones so you know what um uh there's second best college in okay i'm sorry there's it has like an ongoing yeah. competition i didn't know about this i'm very sorry um um so you're like okay the government doesn't understand drones well enough and it's too sci-fi for them so let's well, let's let's just add ai to it and like make them autonomous great that's like not, not that's not much more it's sci-fi love it do you have something you can already show like do you have like demo screenshots I'll, um, do I'll, you have like a I'll, fighter chat in I'll, your room or something uh, uh basically i do have a rc model here but that is not what it is the thing is i had come to my room and i realized that it was today so I we have shown Rahul by the way the prototype which I have here. Yeah, yeah. so if you have photos of that, do you want to pull that up? So I'll just for just... everyone who's here, um, the first time I met Sri Purna was at the IIT Madras campus, mm-hmm. and we met at about nine in the night, and then I finally stumbled back to my room at five o'clock, uh, in the morning. In the morning, okay. Yes, yes. We okay. met at nine p.m. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hours. And oh, five hundred hours. I was back, and then the next morning, eight thirty, I had to be back up again for a panel. Uh, that's awesome. Never regretted a single bit of it. Sure, that's awesome. So, yeah. um, I just why don't we pull up some of the renders of this? And and I think what would be really helpful from everyone who's in the audience as such is to hear about possibly esoteric use cases that you've seen for drones mm-hmm. uh, outside of the standard ones that we hear about. So what Sri Purna specifically been looking at is what are different kinds of areas that we can apply aerial systems on. So just thinking pure first principles. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's there. You can see this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So this is what we have built. I have a second prototype as well. So like basically, I am interested in like if you look at India. This is right what now, range? So this is uh, what range? How far? How long did it take you? Okay, Shibuna? I'll give the specifications right now. Yeah. This drone you can see right here. This can fly at five uh, thousand feet. That is the cruising altitude for this. Mm-hmm. By the way, this is a one is to four scale down prototype. Mm-hmm. So the final prototype of ours is going to be four times bigger. Okay. This can fly at five thousand feet. Uh, maximum flight ceiling is eight thousand feet. Uh, flies at two hundred kilometer per hour. Mm-hmm. Has an endurance of two hours. So basically, a range one way range of four hundred kilometers. Uh, has a payload capacity of one kg. and right now it's electric but uh, we are also we have also uh, got uh, an ic engine right now a small scale ic engine and we are trying to see uh, how much range how much can you optimize it for ic engine mm-hmm. internal combustion engine yeah so th- these are the specifications of the drone we have right now uh, i let me pull up some other stuff where is it mm-hmm. And meanwhile, I will ask Rahul like one a quick question. Like, how many? Like, I have met like a bunch of drone startups in India. Like, how many? Like, how many drone startups do you currently see? Like in India? Like, or, like or what's the what's the? It feels like a lot right now. Is this correct? 
there's um, there's easily like a hundred plus. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, it I I would say maybe a hundred plus just on the IIT Madras campus, mm-hmm. but uh, <laughs> no, quite quite easily a hundred plus startups because again this this goes back to Andreas what we were talking about the democratization of primitives that are available mm-hmm. like Shukar built all of this off of a three D printer mm-hmm. and applies and does that mm-hmm. and he's done this while finishing up his undergrad studies at one of the most competitive institutions to graduate from mm-hmm. and. Um, and that that is truly what speaks for that. If you have ambition and baseline prototypes, uh, baseline uh, primitives, mm-hmm. there's so much that gets built. So uh, this is another fun fact. Shri Purna was awarded as the best entrepreneur at IIT Delhi from his graduating batch. Very, uh, I think just what this was a few weeks ago, last month. Yeah, yeah, e-summit. Yes, here. Oh, nice. I've been to e-summit in Mumbai. We also I, I, had our director unveil the product as well. Like for the first time, I was showing it out after working on it. That's awesome. Uh, what kind of like uh, challenges do you have? Like, how can we help? You so mentioned like before alternative use cases. Um, anything else that would be useful? Uh, basically, right now, if you look at the minute the defense forces, it's quite like everyone has every sector in the defense force has its own use case and like it's quite scattered the need for them the quantitative requirement which the defense forces have so if there was a way you can get to know all of these are like find a way to crack and like this is a platform i have built by the way like Mm -hmm. the use cases for this can be multiple at this scale itself i think i can commercialize this and actually make start making revenue but uh that was not the end goal i have because i want to build something that flies at thirty five thousand feet Basically, that's a, a moonshot for me. Uh, now, this also has, well, this has the capability of, like, I can commercialize it. I also want to see how I can work with the military in building that moonshot goal with the defense forces. How do we go about that? And also opportunities to, like, at other places, in other countries as well. Mm-hmm. That maybe, that is so something maybe- I'm not looking at. No, no, please. So something that might be interesting, Andreas, and if we can get this from some of the audiences, um, stuff that's happening within NATO mm-hmm. for systems like this, what are parallels, what are people thinking about, what's getting built? Because one other way to think about outside of ground up is parallels from what gets built elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And any insights on that from other markets would be very helpful as well. I um, So I don't know how, much, how many uh, war or defense tech experts are in my audience, uh, to be very honest. <laughs> um, I, I think, I think if, if hell divers count a few, uh, if, if, if not, then not that many. Um, the, the, the biggest thing that I have seen recently a lot is like um, drones in the night space. Like I have seen an amazing company in um, IISC uh, 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 called Thalia, if you remember correctly, Thalia uh, Aerospace. Um, so like basically being able to operate in completely denied space, like jamming and everything included. So fully autonomous, purely on vision, um, this kind of stuff, you know, that's like a big topic. And the other big topic I've seen is like long range, um, because we think of drones as something that's like in the immediate vicinity, which isn't really the truth, for example, how it's used in the Ukraine. Um, I talked to like a founder who's literally iterating prototypes at the, at the border, like at the, um, uh, red line, like directly next to the troops, you know, uh, and one of his biggest insights is like the main use case that actually works for them is going far distance to uh, find artillery and then like have very, very clear like positioning for those, you know, um, but I, I'm definitely not like a defense tech, n- neither investor nor expert. Yeah, so air OPs, I think Andreas, what you're describing is um, originally used to be the first use of air craft in the military so mm-hmm. before air force about some military history is uh, the army used to use aircrafts to identify forward positions where artillery could bomb mm-hmm. so there used to be you have observation posts so you have your artillery gun and you would have somebody further up ahead identifying where the artillery gun needs to aim mm-hmm. then they said you know what we can put this person instead of on top of a cliff we can put it put them into a aircraft and that was actually the first usage of aircrafts in warfare Mm-hmm. And that is what is now called an air OP, uh, air observation post, which is what I believe your friend was also talking about. I think it was also like one of the first use cases of the word computing itself. 
Um, like this is where like the first use case, of the, as far as I remember, like I, I learned about this at one point. Cool. Um, yeah. Shri, so, um, yeah. any any last other question? We're running a little bit like late today, so uh, I would wrap it up. Um, like after, like uh, one more question and we wrap up. Questions? I mean, if you have any, like I just want external perspective, so I joined this so that I can get. A, How can the audience be useful to you? Like, what would be useful for you? Uh, basically, uh, spread the word that we exist, that we're building this technology, and like. Uh, other than that, I, I mean, I'm working on my, I'm, I'm also working with the team as well, but trying to find a good team, founding team and like build this as a company. Awesome. If there's any people who's interested in this, who wants to work with me, you can reach out to me. <laughs> you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, any place. So Sipuna, why, why don't you put in your details in the chat? I think mm -hmm. this is good practice for everyone who's here mm -hmm. as well. So for people to reach out. Like throw them afterwards on rfc.to, like where the stream is yeah. running and then like people can contact you. Uh, Shri, awesome. thanks so much for your time. This was awesome. Yeah, yeah. By the way, I want to show you guys one thing which I built out of my dorm room. Okay. So I don't know how legal it is to show it on stream, but let's not. Oh, let's not. Oh no. Let's not. <laughs> let's not. By the way, no, no. Yeah, the, the answer is no. Okay, cool. Andres, <laughs> I think each one of his team continues to get more unhinged. Seriously, <laughs> this is like why I'm always like happy to like I, I shouldn't be investing in defense tech, <laughs> you know, like there's people crazier than me. Uh, uh, cool. cool. Uh, Shri, thanks so much for your time. Bye bye. Yeah, Peace, bye -bye. thank you. Shri. Bye -bye. Um, cool. Yeah, this was crazy. Um, like most competitive uh, uh university, uh, most comp like one of the most competitive degrees. Uh, voted like number one student or something like that uh, on the e-summit, yeah. which is like the, the conference for them, you know, yeah. um, and works on drones uh, for the government uh, on, in, as like, <laughs> as a little weekend startup. Um, cool. Uh, okay. Next one. Um, we have actually two founders, but I think only one of them can join. Let me quickly ask. Let's let's get up in. Sabiashi. Sabiashi. Test test. Sabhya Sabhya Sachi. Sabhya. Sorry. Sorry. Can. Okay. So this is hey, famous Indian clothing designers. Sabhya oh. Sachi. Okay. Uh, does your camera work? Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Does yeah, you... my camera works. One second. Is it? Is it? Is it not turned on? One second. Just let me check. Uh, all right. Yeah. Hey. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good. Sorry for the delay. Hi. 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 That's that's all right. That's all right. That's okay. Um, all right. So, yep. Is, Aru is Arushi joining? No, actually, she is in another meeting, so she she won't be able to join in. Okay, yeah, this is due to uh, the delay. in a physical meeting up. Okay. Oh, sorry? This is due to the delay. Andres, are you seeing the work ethic? It's 11.30 p.m. True. On Friday evening. And both the founders are busy with two separate meetings. Guys, hats off. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rahul. Really, really appreciate it. Cool. So we not we don't have uh, your, your CTO this time on? Uh, uh, it's, uh... Yep, we won't. Okay, cool. Um, uh, what would be useful for you for this uh, for this call? Like, what you what, what's like a good use of your time? We want to obviously hear what you're doing. Uh, anything else that would be good use of your time? Um, sure. So uh, one of the things that uh, we think is sort of worth discussing is the is the kind of uh, things that could come out of uh, as a result of metal 3D printing or a, or compact metal 3D printing or a uh, or a uh, you know you know small format 3d printing mm -hmm. uh, when i say small i'm not referring to the uh, size of part that can be printed but i'm referring to the size of the printer right because generally when you look at metal 3d printers which are you know uh, you know these laser bed powder fusion machines they they they're, they're pretty large right uh, and whereas uh, when you when you look at a uh, FFF or a fused filament fabrication sort of uh, system. It's it's completely different. It's much more compact. They can more or less, uh, you know, yeah. uh, there is, you know, some we, difference we, in the part. Jumping, we're jumping that, a bit far. Um, let's do it like this. Uh, can you quickly screen share and like show what you're working on? Because I think 
the context that you're actually working on a 3D printer for metal is like really interesting right now for people to understand awesome. your question. Right. So, so uh, is it is it okay if I just uh, give a quick brief about what we are doing, who we are, what exactly are we targeting, uh, and what's our goal? Would that be very helpful? Like a like uh, a small yeah, brief. Like, can you can, can you screen share like something? Sure. I I could uh, share my screen and show you the uh, uh, you know uh, one second. Um, sharing screen. Um, just one second. Just, I'm really sorry. Uh, in this, okay, one second. We're very used to uh, using uh, G Meet, so this is a bit different <laughs> than that. All right, all right, awesome. Uh, is 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 this visible to you? This is actually a screenshot, right? Okay. Uh, of the software that we are that we are building. It's called uh, Thinkware. Uh, so at Think Metal, we offer compact metal 3D printer, which has the capacity of uh, uh, which, which has the capacity of 3D printing in metal uh, right at your desk uh, in, in no time using our patent pending process, right? Uh, and uh, typically what, uh, so Arushi and I, we both have uh, uh, known each other for the past uh, six odd years now. We started together uh, and we uh, met when we were, uh, you know, pursuing bachelors in mechanical engineering and were a part of this SpaceX Hyperloop pod competition. Right, and then we went on to work together uh, in a in a in a startup as well, um, uh, which later we quit and then started Think Metal. Uh, and the sole reason for that is because during our previous roles, we we uh, you know were uh, at the forefront of procuring uh, manufactured parts and uh, you know test them. Um, right. Uh, so in, in, in the in the in the process of the same, we've spent a lot of time uh, roaming around the uh, you know uh, you know industrial estates, and that's when we realized that you know uh, manufacturing is actually, especially manufacturing of tools and prototypes, is one very tedious and time consuming, and second, it's very expensive, right? Uh, and that's when it clicked to us why why can't we print metals like we can print plastics, right? And uh, that's how Think Metal was born. Uh, so mm -hmm. typically when you're looking at uh, tooling and prototyping, it, it takes anywhere between two to four weeks to sort of uh, make a make a make a tool. Right. So by tool, I mean uh, a jig, a fixture, a mold, a die, press brick tool, uh, punch die, so on and so forth. Right. So typically uh, these are made out of hard materials, hard metals, right. Hard steels, uh, uh, you know, hardened steels or tool steels uh, uh, or, you know, martensitic steels, basically. Uh, it's difficult to cut through, so that's why it's, it, it takes the time, right? Subtractive manufacturing. So it's much easier to sort of uh, do uh, or manufacture them additively. Uh, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to bring down that time from two to four weeks to literally two days, right? Uh, and we also wanted to bring down the uh, cost of manufacturing and the turnaround time, right? Uh, for the interest of time, uh, this is a software which interacts with the hardware that you can see right now, just, just behind me. This is... Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, one of the think metal systems this is an ugly prototype as you can see right um, uh, and uh, and and so the way it works is through this software right uh, you import a file once you've imported a file uh, you select the material and once you've selected the material you just hit print mm -hmm. right uh, so that's how easy it is and that's how uh, uh, you know that's how intuitive the entire experience is okay so for, for, so, for example sake no, um, sorry. Uh, sorry to wrap you, like, to interrupt you. Um, That's before, okay. before, before this gets like, because like I, I see that you're super excited. And I love that, but like we want to make sure it's like not just like a pitch, basically. Um, I, yeah. So basically, it's like three D printing for uh, metal. Okay. Um, what would right. be useful for you for this call? Like, what would be a good use of your time? Um, I'm sorry. Could you come again, Andreas? Um, what questions do you have? What challenges do you have? And um, Let's, can you stop screen sharing for a second? I actually don't know how to stop you screen sharing. One second. Perfect. Right. Thank you. So, right. So, uh, sure. So you would like to know the challenges that we have, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, the first and foremost challenge is that uh, this has not been done before, right? Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and, and uh, so basically the way that, the way metals are joined uh, is, is via heat, right? Mm -hmm. And and uh, here we we print metal at you know at around 250 degrees Celsius, right? And I'm talking about stainless steel. I have a couple of parts with me if you uh, you know like to see. So these are these are metal parts. Uh, I don't know if it is visible mm -hmm. to you. These are metal parts, sintered metal parts. I I I hope you can hear them, right? Mm -hmm. 
these are metal parts uh, that were printed on 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 our system right on on think metal systems there are other parts as well uh, this is another impeller this is however a green part uh, another centered part this is used for uh, you know bending sheets bending mm-hmm. sheet metal right uh and uh then you have another spur gear right this is typically used in you know uh, lathes uh you know turning machines basically right uh i i just one second i think can you actually move the camera for a second so we see the the machine yep sure right awesome uh quick quick, qu- quick question um you and, said like you uh, sure. this hasn't been done before but like 3d metal printing is a thing right like uh, or or not it is it is a thing it is a thing but it's done using lasers right mm-hmm. and uh, these are very costly setups right uh, you're you're looking at around uh, uh, you know a ticket price of anywhere between 800 starting from 800000 dollars right mm-hmm. so that's how expensive these machines are whereas when we're talking about uh, you know uh, think metal uno uh, uh, the think metal systems uh, our listing price is one tenth of that so uh, the listing price of this is 90000 dollars mhm right so so this is literally one tenth of what is available right now in the market in the laser segment mm-hmm. right uh, however there are other players also who do uh, in a fused deposition modeling technique right uh, they they do 3d print that does exist uh, the only problem being that there are multiple processes in such a compact uh, you know system so there are multiple processes printing debinding sintering what we do is and these are all carried out in three different separate inst- uh, you know uh, equipment types of e- equipment what we do is we directly print and then put it in a sintering furnace where it's debound sintered and heat treated all in one single cycle all in one single equipment mm-hmm. so that ends up saving at least 14 hours in time and because we are able to you know uh, cut down on a process and an equipment it brings down the uh, uh, the price of the of the of the entire system as well what's uh, what's the resolution of the printer like somebody in the audience asked uh, so uh, the resolution of the printer so we can do layer thickness of 100 microns right now Uh-huh. uh as we speak uh in the, in the in the in the in the phase 2 which is the two quarters from now going ahead we'll be able to do 80 microns as well mhm and you're But, not using lasers uh, like how does it can you repeat no. quick, quickly how it works so we are not using lasers what we do use is we use filaments right mm-hmm. and uh, these filaments are uh, uh, patent pending so the entire uh, the, the the composition of the filament is patent pending so if you buy the printer from us you will have to buy the filament from us because it's the only filament which is compatible with this kind of system mm-hmm. uh, and uh, typically the filament uh, is a mixture of metal powders and other binder systems uh, the fun part is uh that you don't have to separately catalytically rebind them uh they get completely thermally debound when you sinter them so that's how you are able to save a hell lot of time uh, even as compared to other uh, uh you know uh, 3d printing uh, compact 3d printers that are there in the market mm-hmm. so sir sir ji if i understood this correctly you're basically you're doing the metal binding the metal binder yes. that's what you're doing right that that's the technique you're not using not, arc not welding No, no, not arc welding, uh, not arc welding, not laser, uh, uh, laser bed powder Binders fusion or the electron beam, right? Yeah. Uh, not exactly binder jetting because these are the filament, right? So the filament is then, you know, it's the molten filament is then deposited layer by layer. It's like plastic 3D printing only. So is this only possible for certain kinds of metals and SS etc. Because, or is this only no? Possible it's possible for MS. no no it's possible because we add certain binders into the into the metal powders right so we add certain amount of binders in the in the in the in the in the in the metal filament uh, which is then printed uh, layer by layer we do remove the binders uh, uh, we do remove the binders when they are centered so that what you are left with is a fully metal part so they are completely thermally degraded the binders okay and um, i'm i'm curious to understand how does how do the binders come out like if you're talking about solid matrices right uh, how, how do like how does it degrade like do you have sublimation so, of, so that it evaporates no 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 won't it get correct correct it it thermally degrades you're right it sort of evaporates it 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 it, it thermally degrades okay and in, in terms of completely like, thermally degrades okay i i'll ask you some more questions later but and what about the general 
mechanical properties of the system etc like is this meant for just pure prototyping can this go into production what tolerance this is, is? functional prototyping this is fun this is for functional prototyping right so uh so for example rahul what happens in tooling is that before you actually make a tool right you you go through a phase of uh, uh you know design and engineering so you make a couple of proto tools and then you make the final tool right uh and typically this journey is pretty long because it takes a while to make these proto tools as well so that is where we come in we you can not only make the proto tools using our printer in fact you can also make the final tool using our printer right so you can you can also print really really hard metals using uh, you know think metal systems uh, can which which can be for example can, i'm can sorry you a, can you do inconel we can do inconel yeah we can do inconel in fact it's a, it's a, it's a it's a part of our phase 3 uh, we we can do inconel and it's a part of our phase 3 so so that's three quarters for now and uh, we we we, uh, we 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 are going to do in canal 625 and 718 both right so that's a that's a part of our third phase and uh, yep and we we will do it to, and un- understood when you said that you'll use it for prototyping but when you said that you can also mm-hmm. use it for production ready how are you testing and right. measuring your prototype quality to be able to say it will withstand the stresses necessary for right. so so for example there are certain astm standards that we follow right uh, there are certain astm standards that we follow and these are for uh, different uh, uh, different different uh, what do you call different test different characteristics basically different mechanical characteristics for example we we we, we test the tensile uh, we we take tensile specimens and we uh, check the tensile strength of the part uh astm etm uh, then we also take the young's modulus of the part we check the density of the part we use uh, uh, you know uh, uh, you know uh, ct scan to uh, scan layer by layer by layer and see where if, if uh, what is the density of the part is there any porosity in the part is, is this part in house with you guys yeah you can you can absolutely That's yeah cool. you can absolutely yeah, scan okay. layer by layer and then you can check how no, how, how taking you up something like that in house already that's pretty cool uh yeah so we do uh, what we call this so there there are couple of uh, a dozen of sensors and cameras on board uh, which can ex- which can actually tell us if if the printer is depositing the layer right okay so 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 that sort of ensures the quality of the final part right if for example if some if let's say in the bulk somewhere the material has been under extruded or under deposited we can actually tell that you know this is the problem and uh, you know we probably have to uh, you know do some sort of heat treatment to uh, to 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 uh, to take care of that folks so i will quickly we'll have to test that i will quickly cut you in because i'm currently feeling like my mother at christmas where she has like no idea what people talk like when when i talk to my mother about like my job you know she's just like nodding along and like just be ha- happy to be here you know this is like literally how i feel right now when you guys like go hard on I'm, 3d printing i'm, I'm really sorry andreas uh, uh, my bad uh, no, no, this is cool this is cool so. this is like exactly why i wanted raul here because like the feedback i can give is like on this is like next to none and like he is like the expert for like deep tech in this kind of stuff you know um mm-hmm. uh, before we wrap up like what would what would be useful for you like from the audience or anybody else like how can people help you how can people help us uh well would 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 love it if people uh you know explore uh what we are trying to do uh they get in touch with touch with us we we uh, very honestly in fact with you know our first couple of our customers with whom we are uh, you know uh, uh, going to deploy our systems we have a fun time uh, you know spreading awareness educating uh, what's there what could be done uh, and 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 various ways in which 3d printing can can come in really handy okay. so this is something that we really enjoy would love people if they you know approach us or you know if they have something really cool uh, you know some sort of cool design some sort of a challenge that hey can you guys sort of print this uh, yeah i think i think that would be pretty awesome awesome um yeah thanks so much for your time um i will wrap it up um we are like already like far over time um say hi to us, uh, say hi from us to arushi uh, like unfortunately she couldn't she couldn't join this time uh like i i yes. read her cv she worked at like hyperloop and a few other things and uh, she's like yep. leading your tech yep. team which is pretty impressive but like please say hi yep. first um and if everybody wants yep. to get in contact uh like thinkmetal.in um and right. uh yeah like rahul you seemed very interested so like maybe you you two afterwards jump on a different call uh last question on my end uh like yep. how, how many hours more do you work today what do you think <laughs> 
<laughs> all right so we have a couple of uh, problems that we are handling right now so our our, our i mean we uh, our team um, um, um i i say this with utmost uh, humility uh, touch wood uh, uh, we are wherever we are because of our team being very honest uh, and uh, they're still working uh, in the in the background as as i speak to you right uh, because we have a couple of uh, systems that need to be deployed uh, there are times when we have literally slept in the office and we do have our brushes two brushes here in the office just in case uh, and 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 the time has ha- yeah yeah there have been times where we've done that right like we have a demo with an investor the next day and then you know we are sleeping in the office uh, the night earlier because we have a demo what's what's your guess for this weekend like for today like what uh, what time do you go to bed today that's a very tricky question we don't go to bed until 4 o'clock in the morning to be very honest like an average like that's the average for i, I can speak for most of the team members in our uh, in our uh, in a, uh, on our team most of them are up till 3 o'clock 4 o'clock and 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 we have like we have chats we have legit whatsapp chats where we are texting at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning 3 o'clock in the morning we are sending uh, youtube videos and stuff like that whatever we are able to find out right? so yeah we are pretty active impressive impressive <laughs> Into work. Cool. Where are you guys based out of? By the way, I'm sorry. We're based out of Chennai. Understood. Nice. Yep. Cool. Thanks so much right. for your time. Uh, thanks for awesome. joining us. Thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you so much for your time. And uh, yeah, we'll 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 probably catch up later as well. Cool. Bye bye. Bye bye. This is super sub. Bye bye. Thank you. Peace. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Rahul, this is crazy. This is like one of the things that. Um, impressed me a lot in india um so i did like a lot of meetings very spontaneously and i had people who were like yeah of course i drive to the airport to meet you at the airport you know on like really short notice no problem i had like three meetings at the airport you know um i had people i had founders i met at like 1 a.m and it was like the most normal thing ever you know what i mean A com- like complete I, i get it like there's a lot of like if people work late in many cases it has to do with like a lot of the industry partners like work on for example pacific time or eastern time like there's like an it makes sense in many cases you know but i also talked to a lot of founders who were not working on san francisco time you know like they weren't working for san francisco clients they were like on their own so for example um when i met went to amidabad to go to one of my portfolio companies i was picked up at like i think 9 p.m. or something Uh, by the founder he was like in a zoom call with an investor uh while driving me you know driving back to the office and i was like expecting we go like maybe for dinner if it's not too late we drove back to the office and the whole team was still there you know um that's yeah. that's crazy you know it's it's very interestingly i think not necessarily because of sf time i've mm-hmm. now noticed this going back to college campuses that is what college campus life is so you land up in any of these colleges and at 12 o'clock in the afternoon mm-hmm. it will look like a wasteland mm-hmm. there's nobody on the street there's nobody walking around and you do the same thing at 12 o'clock in the night you will feel that um there's a carnival going on mm-hmm. and it's this culture that got built, i think at, at a lot of engineering colleges because kids used to go to regular school in the morning and then study after hours for all of these competitive exams mm-hmm. and they just got so used to staying up late mm-hmm. so there is a, the kota factory this is a fun fact about india the place where people go to study for uh, these competitive exams mm-hmm. they have classes that start at 6 in the evening mm-hmm. so you start studying at 6 in the evening you do your classes from 6 to 9 then you do your homework from 9 to 4 in the morning mm-hmm. then you have breakfast at 4:30 and go to sleep and then wake up at 1 o'clock okay and i know literally half of the students at every elite engineering college in india have lived this life for 2 years Crazy. and you just become nocturnal creatures after that and it's also like um it's for like a lot of people don't know is like the iit they're, they're basically centralized tests like if you get accepted you get accepted right like no matter who you are no matter what's your background you know okay. and those standards those tests are standardized all across india and like one thing that like kind of impressed me is like when the G, it's called the jee when it's happening you have actually newspapers that print the pictures of like the winners essentially like on the cover i mean to be fair it's like a sponsored ad basically by a, a company that like does education for those exams fair fair but it's still the, the front page of the newspaper you know what i mean uh, which is which is crazy you know no i th- i 
I used to hate them earlier because I thought it was just, and I still have questions about it. But I think it's still better that we're thinking of these things as role models as mm -hmm. to uh, lots of other people that we used to consider role models earlier. Yeah. Um, and not saying that there's anything wrong with celebrities or influencers or X, Y, Z, but it's great um, that yeah. at least deifying this kind of hard work and ability and talent. And and it truly does like th this one singular exam or just like right after 12th grade has the ability to change the trajectory of your career. Like there's the trajectory of your life, people. like everything. It's a lottery it, it, ticket. It, 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 yeah. 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 It's like if you a, if you get to a good IIT or like another very good university, there's a high chance that you will get like an uh, O1 to the States, for example, which used to be a big thing in the past, still is, you know, like now more and more people stay in India, you know, but like that's a that's a lottery ticket win almost. And like with comparable chances, right? Um, quick, quick, fun to get <laughs> uh, quick, quick fun fact. Um, uh, um, one one thing I personally really like is like um, uh, the, in, in the Indian engineers like reaching out to like open source projects like talented people and like uh, starting just to work, and like as a weird fun fact, um, the uh, email app that we gave the founder a heart attack from, you know, uh, who's like in the chat, his uh, first employee now is like somebody who just like started contributing to his GitHub like because it's open source anyway, and is a kid from India. Like, I think, uh, like, I don't know, like, high school or university, like, early university or something like that. And it's just, like, I think it's a computer science student. Like, basically, just, like, you know what? Like, starting until 4 a.m. isn't enough. I also, like, will just uh, start, like, coding there as a full-time job, you know? The same way as, like, we had before Shri. Like, hey, you know what? Like, what about autonomous drones? Like, why not? That sounds like a good hobby, you know? Like, who needs who needs becoming a DJ? Like, let's build, like, warfare, you know? Like, what the hell? Right. Um, cool. Uh, this was an awesome session. Arul, thanks so much for your time. Uh, thanks for thank you for having me. Thank, yes. thank you for Incredible. covering me. I have like no freaking idea about like neither drones nor three D printing. So you were like a great help. And I also know that you have a big announcement next week, which I cannot spoiler yet. You know, but uh, I thank wish you me. all the best for this one. And uh, thanks so much for your time, dude. Thank you so much, man. It was a pleasure. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye bye. Sweet. Oh. So, folks, thanks so much for joining. We completely overtimed. Uh, it's now almost midnight in India. It's almost dinner time here. And uh, but like, thanks everybody for joining. Uh, thanks for all the founders coming. Um, uh, cheers to uh, Tanush for like explaining a little bit more the DPI, um, which to me is still mind blowing. Um, I, I, at some point, I want to do like a stream on uh, the problems I personally see in Europe, and 99% of them come from the fragmentation and the fact that we have no standards whatsoever, uh, we, and have like the European government mainly focus on regulation. And there's regulation and standardization sound similar, but in, from my point of view, it's not. Um, but like to go one step further, not just to have like standardization, but to have like productization, you know, like have actual APIs for those standards. That's to me crazy. And like just shows how far ahead thinking this is. Uh, this was amazing to me. Uh, I, I really liked uh, the founders. Uh, I, I love giving people in the chat a heart attack by just like cloning casually their project. Um, yeah, anyway, thanks so much for joining today. Uh, that's it. We, we're wrapping it up. Um, if you want to join one of the future sessions, let me know. Um, also, please DM me feedback. Um, let me know. Is this useful to, to do like this content deep dives? Is it useful to have like guests on board? All this kind of stuff. Like all of this here is a big experiment. Okay. So um, you DM me on Twitter. Let me know what you think of this session. Let me know what you think of this whole project. It's a exp weird experiment in total. We had like several hundred people today uh, like joining. Uh, and personally want to thank everybody, uh, one of them. And uh, yeah, that's it. We are now uh, switching off. Thanks so much, folks.